In this video, we'll be having a fresh look at the HD 7970GHz and GTX 780, two high-end gaming GPUs from AMD and NVIDIA back in 2012 and 2013. However, if you were an enthusiast back then, you might know that initially these two GPUs weren't considered to be in the same category, with the GTX 780 coming in at around $650 and the 7970GHz at around $450. To better understand why that was, just what went on in the GPU landscape back then, and where these GPUs stand now, we first need to go back in time a bit. Now, the HD 7970 was originally launched at the end of 2011, and was the first video card based on the 28nm process, and the first to feature AMD's new GPU architecture, Graphics Core Next, or GCN. Since the introduction of R600 in 2007, AMD had been using various iterations of its VLIW-based TerraScale architecture. With GCN, AMD wanted to move to an architecture better suited for both graphics and compute workloads. Compared to TerraScale, GCN offered considerable benefits, mainly to do with better efficiency, flexibility, and also reduced complexity for developers. At the heart of GCN was the new GCN Compute Unit, or CU. The notable things here are that there are four 16-wide SIMD vector units, and the presence of a scalar coprocessor. In the case of the 7970, it consists of 32 of these compute units, meaning it has a total of 2048 stream processors. In NVIDIA terminology, these would be CUDA cores. At the time, the HD7970 replaced the old HD6970, and its main rival was the GeForce GTX 580, based on the Fermi architecture. The HD7970 did beat the GTX 580, but looking back at it now, it was not by any extreme margins. In compute workloads, however, it was very good. A few months later, in March 2012, NVIDIA launched the Kepler-based GTX 680. Although not a radical departure from Fermi, architecturally speaking, some notable changes were that NVIDIA opted to massively increase the amount of CUDA cores compared to Fermi, and the absence of shader clock, with everything now running at the core clock, and better memory and memory controllers for reaching much higher memory clocks. The GTX 680 had to make life difficult for the HD 7970 and 7950, which at the time it did successfully. The 680 was faster, consumed less power, was quieter, and as a cherry on top, it was also cheaper than the HD 7970. By all metrics, the 680 was a success. Now, in June 2012, AMD returned to battle, with the first GPU to feature in this video, the HD 7970 GHz edition. It did not feature any physical changes from the regular 7970, but instead boosted core clocks to over 1 GHz and had a slightly faster memory clock. For NVIDIA, however, this was just the start of Kepler. Just like with Fermi, NVIDIA had multiple different chips for Kepler. There were two that really mattered. For the mid-range gaming market, there was the smaller Fermi GF104 and later GF114. These were versions which offered a slightly tweaked design, with consumer graphics more in mind, and went into cards like the GTX 460 and 560. Then at the higher end, there were the GF100 and later GF110 chips. Now these were designed with a focus both on gaming and compute workloads, and they went into the GTX 480, 580, and in fully unlocked form in the Quadro and Tesla compute cards. Now, the GTX 680 was only based on the small GK104, and now they would be releasing the big Kepler chip, GK110. And the first variant came in the form of the then ridiculous $1000 GTX Titan in March 2013, featuring the GK110 core. It became the fastest single GPU without question, but with its enormous compute capabilities and price it was actually far better suited as a professional product. Which brings me, finally, to the second GPU of this video. Two months after the Titan, in May 2013, NVIDIA released their new mainstream high-end graphics card, 
with the GTX 780. Compared to the Titan, the 780's GK110 core was slightly cut down, but it was still very fast. Starting with Tech Power Up's very comprehensive benchmark suite, over the 18 titles tested, the GTX 780 gave an average of 122% performance of that of the HD 7970GHz. Next up, a non tax review with 10 titles. Here the GTX 780 averaged 120% performance of that of the HD 7970GHz. And lastly, Guru 3D also with 10 games. Here the 780 averages 121% of the 7970GHz's performance. However, that was 7 years ago now, and a lot has changed since then, but most notably, the increase in popularity of the so-called low-level APIs such as DirectX 12 and Vulkan. So it's time to see just what the state of Kepler and GCN is now. And for this test we have some very nice examples of each card. Starting with Team Green, we have the MSI GTX 780 Lightning with the 561 square millimeter GK110 chip with 2304 CUDA cores. Over the standard GTX 780, it runs about 130 MHz faster on the core, boosting to just over 1 GHz. For the memory, we have the standard 3 GB configuration, running at reference speeds. Moving to Team Green, we have the ASUS Matrix 7970 GHz Platinum, with the 352mm Tahiti XT2 chip, with 2048 stream processors. Out of the box it runs 50 MHz faster than the reference design, boosting to 1100 MHz. The 3 GB GDDR5 frame buffer also gets a nice boost, running 150 MHz faster than the reference design. In terms of drivers we have the AMD Adrenaline 20.7.2 and for Nvidia the 451.67. Both cards have been tested on an overclocked 8700K testbed to eliminate any bottlenecks. Firstly, I should mention that all titles have been tested at 1080p. Starting with Shadow of the Tomb Raider from 2018, developed by Eidos Montreal and running on the Foundation engine. Tested using the built-in benchmark with the medium preset and no anti-aliasing. Here the 7970GHz takes a commanding lead over the GTX 780, as it is 22% faster. Both DirectX 11 and DX12 resulted in near identical performance, with an average of 57 frames per second, and strong 0.1 and 1% lows. The GTX 780 also performed similarly with DX12 as it did with DX11. Now going back in time with Assassin's Creed Odyssey, also from 2018 and developed by Ubisoft Quebec, running on the Anvil Max 2.0 engine, also tested with the built-in benchmark with the medium preset. It's very close here with the 7970GHz being just ever so slightly faster, with an average of 51 frames per second over 50 of the GTX 780. On the front of 0.1% lows, the 780 is 3 FPS better, but overall it's pretty much a tie. Moving on to Metro Exodus from 2019, developed by 4A Games and running on the 4A engine. Running the train ride scene with medium settings, no anti-aliasing and 16x anisotropic filtering. Here the GTX 780 is 16% faster than the 7970GHz, with an average of 71 frames per second. The 7970 still managed over 60 FPS with a 61 average. 40.1 and 1% lows both performed similarly. Switching to DirectX 12, both cards took a big performance hit, but relatively speaking, the GTX 780 did do better here as well. Next up, Rockstar Games' Red Dead Redemption 2, from 2018, running on the Rage engine. Also running the built-in benchmark with medium settings, no anti-aliasing and 16 times anisotropic filtering. Just like with Shadow of the Tomb Raider, the HD 7970GHz dominates with a 28% lead over the GTX 780, scoring 45 FPS average in DirectX 12 and 41 FPS average in Vulkan. Meanwhile the GTX 780 could only muster up 35 FPS average in Vulkan. It is worth noting here that the 780 can't run this title in DirectX 12. While Kepler can do DirectX 12, 
it only has support for the lowest feature level, being 11.0. First generation GCN on the other hand also has support for 11.1. The next game is Borderlands 3 from 2019, developed by Gearbox Software and running on Unreal Engine 4. Testing was done with the built-in benchmark with medium settings. Now Unreal Engine 4 is known to run really well on Nvidia cards, and here it is no different, with the GTX 780 being 33% ahead of the 7970 GHz. The 780 averaged 64 FPS, and the 7970 GHz only 48. 0.1 and 1% loads were respectable on both cards, even though they were both running into their 3GB VRAM limit. Moving on to Control from 2019, developed by Remedy Entertainment and running on the North Light engine. Tested using a gameplay sequence with medium settings and no anti-aliasing. Here the 7970GHz takes the lead once again, with a lead of 13% over the GTX 780, scoring an average of 54 FPS in DirectX 11 and 47 in DirectX 12, but with better 0.1 and 1% lows in DX12. The GTX 780 produced the same 47 FPS average in DirectX 11 as the 7970 did in DirectX 12. Just like with Red Dead Redemption 2, the GTX 780 can't run this title in DirectX 12 because of the insufficient feature level support. On to World War Z from 2019, developed by Saber Interactive and running on the Swarm engine. The HD 7970GHz showed very strong performance once again beating the 780 with an average of 77 FPS in Vulcan versus 74 FPS on average for the 780 in DirectX 11. As you can see, the GTX 780 really did not enjoy running under Vulcan, as it could only do an average of 30 FPS with truly terrible 0.1 and 1% lows. And last, but certainly not least, Wolfenstein Youngblood, also from 2019, produced by Machine Games and Arcane Studios, and running on the ID Tech 6 engine. Here we see by far the biggest win of the HD 7970 GHz. Just like in World War Z, the GTX 780 struggled severely with the Vulcan API, and as a result the 7970 GHz is well over twice as fast, scoring 82 FPS average, with great 0.1 and 1% lows. The 780 struggled to get past even 30 FPS, with an average of 36, and only 21 for the 0.1 and 1% lows. It should also be noted that both cards nearly saturated their 3GB of VRAM. Let's move on to some synthetic benchmarks, starting with DirectX 12, a 3D Mark Time Spy, using the default settings. Here the GTX 780 is comfortably ahead of the 7970 GHz, scoring 18% higher with a score of 3239 over 2742. Up next is Unigen Superposition in DirectX 11, and here the GTX 780 takes a 16% lead, with a score of 7244 points over 6231 for the HD 7970 GHz. And lastly we have the newest test from the Finnish Basemark company, with Basemark GPU 1.2, sporting both DirectX 12 and Vulkan. And here the 7970 and 780 were virtually tied, with a score of around 3200 points. Although strangely the 7970 did not enjoy DirectX 12 here, whereas it virtually had no impact on the GTX 780. Now those are quite the results for the 7970 GHz. Let's put all of these results together and now we get the following picture. On average the GTX 780 now only produces 92% of the performance of the 7970 GHz. At its best 133% in Borderlands 3, and at its worst only 44% in Wolfenstein Youngblood. And that is a huge difference when we compare it with the reviews that launched back in 2013, where at average it was around 120% performance of the 7970GHz, to now only 92, so we've gone from plus 20 to minus 8. Now that is pretty big. If we chart the results in a slightly different way, we can more clearly see where the 780 falls short, showing considerate performance deficits in Control, Shadow of the Tomb Raider and Red Dead Redemption, and of course the biggest difference of them all in Wolfenstein Youngblood. Although it should definitely be noted that the GTX 780 performed considerably better in both Metro Exodus and Borderlands 3. If we look back at the reviews of 2013, pretty much all titles were in DirectX 11, 
However, if we look at the titles in DirectX 11 now, the GTX 780 is still lacking performance. But what mainly stood out about the GTX 780 in these tests is just how terrible Kepler handles Vulkan. Apart from Basemark GPU, in the three games tested with Vulkan, the 780 falls flat on its face. Now, for us to why the 7970GHz is now so much faster compared to the Kepler GTX 780, we can consider a few things. Firstly, GCN was designed from the beginning with a synchronous compute in mind, which is a big aspect of both DirectX 12 and Vulkan. AMD's so-called asynchronous shaders utilized multiple ACEs, or asynchronous compute engines, of the GCN architecture. Their purpose is to accept work and dispatch it off to the CUs for processing. And these ACEs can operate in parallel with the graphics command processor and two DMA engines. Also, back then AMD was very much on the forefront of low-level APIs and async with their Mantle API, which was eventually merged into Vulkan. On the other hand, why has Kepler aged poorly? Well, for a start, unlike GCN, Kepler was not designed from the beginning with async compute in mind. Also, another key change with Kepler was the new configuration of the CUDA cores. Per SMX unit, they now packed 192 CUDA cores total, and this caused some issues. Now, the thread scheduler issues threads to these CUDA cores via a warp, which is a set of 32 threads. An SM can only issue instructions from 4 warps per cycle, meaning only 4x32 or 128 CUDA cores in total can be saturated. To saturate all 192, something known as instruction level parallelism is needed, and this requires special tweaking from the developers. If this isn't done, you're leaving effectively 33% of the CUDA cores without work. When Nvidia came out with Kepler's successor, Maxwell, they took note of this and changed back to 128 CUDA cores per SM, or a power of 2, making it align with the warp size and therefore make it easier to utilize efficiently. So, all in all, I do think it's pretty safe to say that the GCN-based 7970 GHz has aged considerably better than the Kepler-based GTX 780. We've now gone from 120% performance for the GTX 780 compared to the 7970 GHz to only 92%. And that is a pretty big shift in performance. Most notably because the 7970 is just a lot better with low-level APIs such as Vulkan. Also, with in the future more and more games moving towards DX12 and Vulkan and away from DirectX 11, it is pretty safe to say that the 7970's lead will only increase in that way. However, it should be noted that still despite the 7970 doing so well compared to the 780, it still only managed in three games to get over 60 FPS average, so while it has certainly aged better, it is still showing its age. Well, that was all for now. I really thought that it was really rather interesting, and I hope you guys did as well. If you did, a like would be much appreciated, and why not consider subscribing if you want to be kept up to date on future projects? Also, I would like to be interested in your personal experience with Kepler and GCN, so if you could leave those in the comments below, it would be much appreciated. Well, that was all for now, and bye-bye.